Turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Luke 19. Luke 19, we'll be looking together at verses 41 through 48 today. Luke 19, verse 41 through 48. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes the, and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. So far, the reading from God's word, may he add its blessing to our hearts this morning. Well, I want you to try to imagine the scene of, of what we just read together. Uh, you remember the context of this passage is, is the triumphal entry. Uh, the triumphal entry, uh, Jesus on a foal, walking down the road towards Jerusalem, coming down the Mount of Olives, people celebrating. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Garments being placed on the road, uh, palm branches being cut down, placed on the road. The King is coming. There's a joyful exuberance amongst all the crowd. And in the middle of that, Jesus is having these thoughts. They turned the corner, maybe. Jerusalem had been obstructed from their view. And then uh, Jesus sees it. In the center of all this joyful mob, they turn the corner and they see Jerusalem. And the crowd is cheering. And Jesus is weeping. Jesus is weeping on his donkey in the midst of all the celebration. It's because Jesus, in seeing Jerusalem, is reminded of what will take place. He is grieving over the unbelief, over the judgment that will come to Israel. He grieves over it. And yet at the same time as, as grieving over the judgment of Israel as a whole, his zeal for the purity of his father's worship is greater than his grief. And it causes him in the, in the next instant to cast out those who would profane his father's temple. This is the Savior of sinners. This is the Messiah sent at that time in that place to bring redemption for his people. And he grieves over those who will reject him. And yet he also has enough zeal for his father that he will not allow his worship to be profaned. And uh, we seek to learn that together today, this, this grief over judgment, but the zeal for the worship of God, by looking at two things from this passage. First, we want to see the future state of Jerusalem in verses 41 through 44. And then we want to look at the present state, not present in our day, but present in Jesus' day, the present state of Jerusalem in verse 45 through 48. So, Christ grieves over the unbelief and the judgment of Israel, but his zeal for the purity of his father's worship is greater than his grief. We're going to look first at the future state of Jerusalem, and then we're going to look at the present state of Jerusalem. So we'll begin by looking at the future state of Jerusalem. It's important to recognize that Jesus, when he's weeping on this donkey, is not weeping over what he must endure as the Messiah. He's not weeping over his suffering that he will face. He is weeping because of what Jerusalem represents. He is weeping because he knows Jerusalem, more than just a city, is significant in God's economy of redemption. He's weeping because he knows how the people within this city will respond to him as the Messiah. Jesus, he is the, the creator of all things. Colossians 1, Colossians 1 tells us that. 
in the beginning God created and God the Son created all things. That's Jesus uh, Christ. He, he, as the creator of all things, is aware of the condition of His creation. Uh, the world that He created is now living in the hopelessness of the effect of sin. Adam and Eve, Adam specifically, sinned against God, and because he sinned against God, all the world is plunged into corruption. Yet in this, cor this flood of corruption, in this world that God made, one nation was set apart by God immediately after the fall to be the nation through whom the Messiah would be brought into the world. It was the, the nation of the Hebrews, the Jewish people, the people whose capital city is Jerusalem, the people who built for the worship of God a temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus, as He's coming down that mountain, He looks and He sees that city and He knows what it represents, the center of worship and the center of government of the people that should have been His, and He knows what they will do. He knows that they will reject Him. Uh, Jesus, in, in essence, is living the reality of what is recorded in John's Gospel, the first chapter, the 11th verse. Jesus came to His own, and what did His own do? His own did not receive Him. Jesus is coming to terms with, with those thoughts as He walks down on, well, as He's carried down on, on the donkey, He's carried down the Mount of Olives. And you can see, in Jesus, this is not a business transaction. Sometimes we can think of salvation that way, right? Uh, Jesus has some and He doesn't have others and He died for some, He didn't die for others, and oh well, that's, that, that's not how Jesus thinks about it. For Jesus, it's not a, a business transaction. It's something that overwhelms Him. It's something that overwhelms Him and He is filled with grief and He weeps as He moves towards uh, Jerusalem. And through His tears then, in, in the first section, He expresses a lament over what will take place in Jerusalem. Jesus knows. Jesus knows what will take place in Jerusalem. And He's weeping over it, and He is expressing this lament as He, as he, as he makes His way. And you see there in verse 42, uh, the, the, the main essence of His lament. Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. He's grieving because they don't know the gospel. He's grieving because they don't understand how they will be reconciled to God. He grieves over them because they do not know, in an experiential sense, what it means that Christ has come. What it means that, that He was born a Savior, that He would die on the cross. Long ago, God had laid out for the people of Israel their covenant obligations. God had set before them through Adam, through Abraham, through Sinai, through the prophets, through David, what it means to be His people. God has said to Israel, I will be your God and, and you will be my people. If. It's okay to say, God said if. There's a condition to God's Covenant promises. That doesn't mean that they're meritorious. That doesn't mean that Israel earned His covenant promises. But there is a condition for the people of God. There must be a recognition among God's people wherever and whenever God has gathered them of what makes for peace. There must be a recognition by God's people of how they are reconciled to God. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, the condition is the same because the Old Testament and the New Testament, except for the first three chapters of Genesis, are all a manifestation of God's gracious plan of redemption for His people. Old and New Testament, same thing. God's grace showered on His people. And the condition, therefore, has always been the same. And what is the condition? The condition is not you must do such and such and so and so and here's your list, check it off, otherwise you're not getting into heaven. That's not the condition. The condition that God sets for His people is you must know 
most certainly, without a doubt, that there is nothing that you can do to reconcile yourself to God. That you cling completely to God's gracious gift of salvation and to that gift alone. That is the condition. It's a condition of the covenant of grace. It's the condition of faith. This is what God sets before His people in, in all times and in all places. And it's, it's demonstrated in, in different places, demonstrated in the Old Testament. We were talking about it not too long during one of the Wednesday night studies that we had. There is uh, that event in the book of Numbers where Israel, where Israel grumbled against God and, and God sent the fiery serpents among them and, and struck down many of them. Right? And, and you remember the solution, uh, how they were to ac accomplish peace in that moment? They were to build a, a pole with a bronze snake on it. And whoever looked at the snake would be restored, would be healed. Well, is that not a, a condition of works? And most certainly not. Because we know later on that serpent is destroyed because people were worshipping it. It was an instrument wherein God tested the faith of his people. Did they trust God enough that if they looked at a bronze snake on a pole, that they would be healed from these poisonous bites? It, would, it was a manifestation of the condition that God sets for his people in the Old and the New Testament. Faith. And Jesus is crying out about that as he's walking towards, as he's being carried towards Jerusalem. Would that you knew what would bring about peace in your life. Jesus weeps because he knows that this knowledge is not in Israel. In fact, we know from verse uh, 42 that it's hidden from their eyes now. She has been called to repentance, the people of Israel. She, they have been called to repentance. They have been called to faith for centuries. These people have been called to faith for centuries. There is the prophets. There, is, there, there are the prophets. There are the promises of God. There is, and these people have been sent to the Israelites generation in and generation out. In fact, they have been faithless. They have been carried into exile. And God has even brought them back to show the faithfulness of His promise. And yet, and yet they do not know the things that make for peace. The people of God, at least the religious leaders of this time, they're even hostile to Christ. They see the Messiah and they say, I don't want him to be my king. I don't want anything to do with him because he is upsetting my traditions. He's upsetting my preferences. And so the religious leaders, they're, they're openly hostile to God, uh, to Christ. It says uh, later on that they're seeking to destroy him. And they're leading the people. And the people seem to be fairly fickle. The, the same group, the same crowd that's shouting praises to him here, later on will call for his crucifixion. They're not grounded in the truth. They do not know the things that, that make for peace. And after centuries of reaching out, after centuries of setting the gospel before them now, they're covered with a veil. Their hearts cannot see it. Uh, the Apostle Paul later on will, will talk about that in, in 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 3, speaking of the people of Israel and how their hearts and minds have been hardened. It says, For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. Their hearts have been hardened. The very things that should turn them to Christ are, are hidden from them. And so Jesus, when he turns that corner and he sees Jerusalem and all that it represents, he knows what is needed for their salvation is hidden from their eyes. They are condemned and they will face the judgment of God. They do not know, they cannot know what makes for peace. And the creator of the universe looks at his creation. And he looks at his people, from, from the people of the promise from the Old Testament. And he realizes they have rejected him. He has come to his own, and his own has not known him. You, you remember the prophet Hosea? Hosea, usually known for God's call on his life to marry a woman of unfaithfulness. 
to demonstrate the, 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 the abomination, the apostasy of his people, the adultery, the spiritual adultery of the people of Israel towards him. But there are other things that communicate that same truth in Hosea's life. Hosea has sons. And one of his sons' name is, is Lo-Ami. That'd be like you and me welcoming our little son into the world and saying, ah, not my people. So good to meet you finally. This was his name. He would be playing in the neighborhood. Not my people, come in for supper. A testimony. God's people are not his people. Their hearts have been covered with a veil. The things that ought to bring them redemption have no effect on them. And so Jesus weeps. Israel will be destroyed and judged, uh, we know from history, in about 40 years. This is about 30 A.D., maybe a little bit later. And Jerusalem is destroyed in in 70 A.D. Uh, All that Jesus is describing here, uh, the enemies will surround and put up a barricade. They'll hem them in on on every side. They'll tear them down, the children, and and they will be destroyed, and, and no stone will be left on each other. This took place. 70 A.D., a Roman commander, Titus, came and laid waste to the city of Jerusalem. The the city was surrounded by the Roman armies, and the Jews themselves, uh, under the leadership of the zealots, uh, brought such a reign of terror on each other that that the destruction was horrific. And the city was destroyed. The Romans tore down buildings and walls. Nothing was left standing. The destruction was horrific. And it says in our passage, verse 44, that this destruction comes, in part at least, because you did not know, because they did not know the time of your visitation. They did not recognize the baby in the manger as the Savior of sinners. They did not recognize that the one whom the angels announced would hang on the cross to die for sinners such as they are. They did not see with Simeon's eyes You remember that aged man who came to the temple and he saw Jesus and he he grabbed Jesus from Joseph and Mary and and he says, paraphrase, now, now I can die because I have seen God's promised Redeemer. He saw that the baby was the one through whom peace came to the world. They didn't see it that way, though, the people of Jesus' day. They didn't see that they could depart in peace once they laid their eyes on Christ. And so in the middle of the parade, Jesus laments. It's not for the first or the last time that Jesus laments over the city of Jerusalem. In Luke 13, Jesus predicts this very moment. He says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, that's taking place right now. He's, uh, he says later on when he's, he's walking to the cross... He he pronounces the same kind of lament over Jerusalem. When Jesus looks at Israel, he sees only one thing. He sees judgment. He sees judgment for their faithlessness. He, he, He sees mourning. He doesn't see celebration. He sees the city of Jerusalem, and he sees a city full of souls that are condemned. And he weeps over it. But next, he, he returns to the present state of Jerusalem. And in that state, we see that his grief over the judgment of Israel is superseded by his love for the purity of the worship of God. Now, uh, for the people of Jesus' day, it, it may not be obvious. Uh, they're not weeping when they're walking to Jerusalem. They're not looking at Jerusalem with the same eyes that Jesus is looking at Jerusalem. They're not... They're not wailing in the streets. To them, it seems probably like things are going fairly well. They have the temple. They have priests in the temple. They have religious leaders who are teaching them the traditions of the, of the rabbis and are tra- teaching them the, the laws of, of Moses. They have, they have all these things. They are, in essence, the epicenter of the only place where the true worship of God is practiced at that time in history in all of the world. They have a corner on the market. And there's reason for them to to be optimistic, at least from an 
from an external position. But it's not always as it seems in life. The health and the spirituality of Israel is, is external only. They're holding things together, but they're doing it with makeup. I had a friend in uh, high school. He wanted to sell his car. And the problem with the car was that it wasn't necessarily a very pretty car. It had lots of dents and lots of dings, and, and the paint was a little rusty. And so he was a handy fella. So before he sold his car, he got Bondo. You know what Bondo is? It's like filler, right? So he got the Bondo, and he put it on the body of his car, and he sanded it all down, and he, and he covered it with paint, and he put it on the market, and he sold it. And he was telling me about it later. He goes, oh, this guy, he came, and he bought the car, and I was so worried because all the places where I, was, where I had put the Bondo, he was kicking them. And I knew that if that paint cracked, if that Bondo cracked, if it fell down, the game was over. There's no way the, the car would have sold anymore. That's the condition of Jerusalem at that time. It maybe looked good on the outside, but it was being held together with Bondo and paint. There was nothing healthy about Jerusalem at that particular time. The worship of Israel was, was just business. The worship of, and I, I'm generalizing, I'm not saying there were no believers amongst the people of Israel, but the leaders, the people at the temple, for them it was, it was business. Jesus, he comes in that condition to Jerusalem. He enters the temple and he begins to drive out those who are selling. Selling in the temple. In uh, the parallel passage in Matthew 21, we we know that what they were selling was currency and what they were selling were, were animals for sacrifices. And Jesus throws them all out because these people had made the worship of, of the temple have nothing to do with what it means to know what makes for peace. They had no concern about how to be reconciled to God. They wanted to make some money. And this was a great place to do it. If anybody wanted to worship Yahweh, the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, they had to come to Jerusalem. And they had to come to the temple. And they had to bring animals for sacrifice. Well, they couldn't all do that. So why not provide them a service? And, well, we might make a little profit on the side, but isn't that our right to make a little bit of profit on the side? They had turned the worship of God into an opportunity. Power and wealth was to be had from the worship of the Lord. And they knew they had the monopoly. And so there was a store set up right inside the temple. We would never do that in our day, of course, set up a store inside the, the place where God's worshipped. But they did it in those days. They had a store in the temple. And Jesus is incensed by it because the worship of God is polluted. The worship of God is corrupted. And so not only does he enter Jerusalem as a king on a donkey, the name of David proclaimed, but here he comes into the temple and he acts as the high priest, doesn't he? This is his temple. He will cleanse it and he will, uh, he will make sure the worship of his God is purified. He's the king, he's the high priest, and he comes into Jerusalem. And he says to the people as he's casting them out, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. This speaks volumes of the condition of Jerusalem in that day. Because the first part, my house shall be a house of prayer, that is taken from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 56 and verses 6 and 7. And there, the context of that prophecy is the restoration of the people of Israel as they begin again to acknowledge God and the Gentiles are included in it. It's describing what takes place under Jesus' ministry, doesn't it? And, and, and as it's describing that time and that place and the glory of God being manifested in that way, it says the temple will be a house of prayer for all nations. But the Jews of Jesus' time have made Jerusalem something quite different. The second part of that, 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 that castigation from Jesus, you have made it the den of robbers, that, ta that is taken from the prophet Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 11, 
uh, there the prophet is castigating uh, Israel for their faithlessness and is speaking to them about the judgment that will be theirs. So what should be a, a place of great blessing where all the nations will come for prayer, the Jews have corrupted it, the Jews of Jesus' day, and the religious leaders have made it a den of robbers. Where there should be the blessing of God's people, now there will be the condemnation of God on His people. It's a warning. Christ is giving them a warning with regard to their apostasy. The robbers, that's what they are. They lie in wait and they steal another person's money. That's what they're doing to the Lord. They're not stealing from people so much. They're stealing from God Almighty, the worship that is due His name. The Messiah, He, he doesn't he cannot stomach the desecration of the temple, of the worship of God. He can't handle, or it enrages him, that the leaders of that day would take that which would give peace, that which would promise salvation, and turn it into something they can use for their own prosperity. Jesus, he doesn't desire the destruction of his people. That's why he's crying. That's why he's weeping. He desires, Isaiah 56, 7, that this would be a place of prayer for all nations. He doesn't want Jeremiah 7 and verse 11, that there would be a place of a den of robbers. And so Jesus, he doesn't leave that place after, after excoriating these traitors, uh, but he, he teaches. He goes to the temple. It says in verse 47, he teaches daily in the temple. And what he says, and what he teaches, he says in the full hearing of the priests and the scribes and the leading citizens of, of the city. These are the men who profit, of course, most from the status quo. And their response is hatred. Their response is a desire to kill Jesus. They have become rich through the, uh, the corruption of the temple worship. And when they hear Jesus' words, they hate him for it. It's, uh, the, I, I, I find these words in Scripture, some of the most ironic in all of Scripture, that the people of the, the Jews have the veil so firmly placed over their heart that they can be and so enraged at a man over breaking their traditions that they would like to murder him in violation of God's law. It seems completely reversed. They want to destroy him. They want to kill him. And it's the clearest picture of the hypocrisy of that day. God, in His wisdom, in verse 48, tells us why Jesus wasn't killed right there on the spot. It's because of the fear of man. The fear of man is so deep in these rulers that they will not arrest Him during the day. They will not, uh, uh, they will not crucify Him or have His trial during the day. They have to come during the night to do that. For now, he is too popular with the people. There is some time, and they do certainly change the people's minds, but they uh, do not act on Jesus quite yet. So the grief of Jesus on his way into Jerusalem, it's, it's demonstrated. The reason for his grief is demonstrated when you look at the condition of the temple and the condition of the worship of, of Israel at that time. There isn't any anticipation of the coming of the Messiah. Rather, in the place where that should be taking place, there is a worldly profiteering from the sacrifices and tithes of others. Now, this passage of Scripture is not simply an interesting account for us to read, so we can judge and say, look at how terrible the Jews were at that time. Uh, if Jesus had to come during, and when we were on the, wor in the earth, uh, things would have been much different. That's not why we read an account like this. This account of Scripture uh, holds forth, forth glorious promises and also obligations uh, for us as well. And the first thing that it sets before us today, with urgency, I might add, is a question. And that question is for all of us. And it's a question that we can only, in all its fullness, answer in our own hearts. And that question is, do you know the things that make for peace? Do you know the things that make for peace? It's not a question that deals with how many things you have on your bucket list. It's not a question that deals with that. 
It's not a question that deals with your financial security. It's not a question that deals with whether or not you have the house that you always wanted. It's not a question that deals with whether or not you have the cars, uh, car of your dreams. It's a question that deals with whether or not you know the one who came into the world to die for sinners. It's a question that asks whether or not the, you know the one we are ostensibly celebrating during this time of year. Do you know him? Is he your savior? Is he the only one that you love? Or is he an afterthought? If Christ is not preeminent in your affections, I want to be very clear in how I say this. I want, I want everybody to be hearing what I'm saying. If Christ is not preeminent in your affections, you do not know the ways that make for peace. You do not know it, beloved. And so this passage is urging you. This passage is setting before you. Know the ways of peace. Uh, we recently studied in Galatians the fruit of the Spirit. right? Love, joy, peace. Does the Spirit dwell in you? It is a question we all must answer, and the way we answer it has eternal consequences. Do you know the gospel? Do you know that apart from Christ Jesus, you stand condemned? Do you know that because of Christ Jesus, you are forgiven? Do you know that through Christ Jesus, you are made holy, you are sanctified, you are a new creation? That knowledge and that knowledge only is what leads to peace. Do you know the things that make for peace? The second thing that we learn is to guard the purity of the worship of the church. Now, this is certainly a charge that is for the leaders of the church, those of us who are here as elders. Now, this is something that is set before us in great clarity here in this passage. And to the elders here, the worship of God's people, how we worship God, it is to be guarded. It is to be protected. It is to be central in our lives. When we come together and we lead as elders in the church of Christ, we lead His people. We have not come to a social club. We have not come to a place where friends get together once a week for fun. We do those things. We do because we're the body of Christ. But our primary purpose for coming together is the worship of God. And God, in His infinite wisdom, has taken broken vessels like you and like me and has charged us with preserving it. This is our responsibility as God's under-shepherds. This is the bride of Christ that we have been, we've been told to govern. And so what we do in worship is, is central Protect her worship from profiteering. Protect her worship from corruptions. It is our sacred, sacred duty. It is our sacred calling. What we do in this hour, this hour of corporate worship, it sets the tone for, for all our worship at home and in, and in the workplace. So we are to lead well in this area. It is to be taken seriously. As elders, we are to we are to lead and protect the worship of God's church, so we better be on our knees for it. We better be praying about it. We better be praying for the church and for her worship. We better be leading the church in her worship. Let it never, never be said of, of you and of me. Let it never be said of you and of me that in the place where we served as under-shepherds, the worship of the church really became the worship of man. Let that never be said of us. But it's not only a charge that is given to the elders of the church. 
It is a charge that is given to all God's people. All Israel was responsible for the purity of the worship of God. Same thing is true for the new Israel. We are all responsible for the purity of the worship of God. If you are here as a church member, just because the elders will be held responsible doesn't mean you just get to show up. Doesn't mean you get to be a warm body in the pew that's, that's here uh, whenever you feel like it. It's the elders' responsibility. <clears throat> but listen to me. The elders of this church, gifted men as they are, committed to the Lord as they are, they can do nothing to change your heart. They can do nothing to control your actions. Nothing. They can't do a thing about it. All the elders can control, by God's grace, this is all prefaced in God's Spirit working in us, is the thoughts of their own mind, the actions of their own hands, the words from their own lips, and the structure of this worship service. Whether it's true worship, whether you come with a heart that's lifted up with joy to God, they can't do a thing about it. That is your responsibility. Prepare yourself then. Prepare yourself each time before we come to worship. Prayerfully prepare yourself to come to the temple of God to praise His name. Don't let your worship be perfunctory, something that you do because you're supposed to or because you've always done it or because your parents are making you. Come to church, enjoy and gladness. Let your worship be guided by the Spirit. Prepare your heart. Delight yourself in Christ. Christ's grief over the unbelief of Jerusalem comes because He knows the judgment that will result from their unbelief. The tribal nation that brought forth the Savior has turned its back on Him, and it's about to be judged for it. This grieves Christ. It grieves Him so much that in the middle of great celebration, He is weeping. He is a merciful Savior, but He's also just. He's also righteous. He also does not uh, allow His Father's worship to be corrupted, and His zeal for the purity of this worship shows it. The people of Jerusalem, they did not know the things that lead to peace, and that's the question for us as well. Do you know Christ? Do you trust Christ? Do you follow Christ? These are the most important questions that we can ever answer. Let's pray.